And then really thinking about this from the perspective that um, in many of the tumors that we're interested in, solid tumors, um, obviously spatial structure is important and um, this is part of the motivation for these multi-region sampling studies that um, Christine introduced. So there's been tremendous efforts from the Cancer Genome Atlas and the International Cancer Genome Consortium to catalog cancer genomes and I think um, the pain cancer studies uh, across 33 different tissue types are now wrapping up that presumably many in the room and we have also contributed to. And I think, you know, we've learned a lot about what the spectrum of somatic alterations are and how we can begin to assimilate this information. And we heard a wonderful talk from Christina Leslie about the different features that we have at the epigenomic spectrum. And I think there still remains a tremendous challenge, though, in how we really assimilate all of this information and link to clinical outcomes. And of course, the TCGA studies and ICGC have largely focused on profiling a single bulk tumor specimen. That's in part due to the practical considerations around these large-scale efforts and, the, and really the challenges of obtaining um, multiple samples and how one thinks about doing that, as well as the cost and the initial tissue input requirements. But of course, as we all know, intertumor heterogeneity is pervasive. And when we do go in and sample from different regions of a tumor, as Nikki um, elegantly demonstrated, we find heterogeneity at almost every level we can imagine. Um, again, for pathologists, this is nothing new. Uh, cellular heterogeneity has been pervasive and appreciated for many decades. We're just getting better at quantifying it. And I think the fundamental question here is how much does intratumor heterogeneity confound our best efforts at precision medicine? And some of us, I think, were initially a bit, were quite concerned when we start to look at the fact that if we sample different regions, in this case of a patient with glioblastoma, done in the operating suite where we had a fabulous surgeon who could go in and isolate different regions, we found that a singular patient could be classified in as many of three of the recently described four molecular subgroups of glioblastoma. And that was an effort that came out the previous year. And so this raises the question, how much of intertumor heterogeneity is actually functional? And perhaps moreover, how can we leverage patterns of heterogeneity to interrogate the evolutionary dynamics of a tumor? And so obviously we know that tumor progression is an evolutionary process, but I point out a very seminal study from Daryl Shibata and Simon Tavare, where they demonstrated using a much lower resolution technology, namely microsatellite-based typing, that more than half of all somatic alterations in colorectal tumors happen prior to transformation. This work was subsequently, subsequently followed up by others using current sequencing modalities, next generation sequencing, and in fact, this conclusion is in the title. But I point this out because a lot of what happens during tumor progression is completely occult to the human eye. And in fact, there's a very long latency during which tumors develop, in many cases, accruing somatic mutations over decades of time before transformation occurs and we eventually detect a symptomatic lesion. And so indeed, this, this process is, um, requires strategies to go back and un unearth its ancestry. So despite the fact that we can't directly observe this process, these studies that I've just shown you and now dozens of others have demonstrated that tum somatic alterations faithfully report on tumor ancestry, and this is true not just for point mutations, but for structural variants and copy number alterations, as well as for epigenetic alterations um, if they're chosen wisely. And so what I would put forth is that in fact what happens during the very first few cell divisions after transformation may provide clues as to how we can better detect, treat, and, and ultimately prevent uh, carcinogenesis. So what we're really interested in here is understanding the dynamics of how tumors diversify. And while this is absolutely fundamental to the processes that we've been talking about today, including metastasis and therapeutic resistance, and we understand the elements of somatic evolution, which include drift, mutation, and selection, we fundamentally have a very limited understanding of their dynamics. And this is in part due to our reliance on bulk samples, meaning that this requires additional computational techniques to deconvolve what's observed in a bulk population. But also, it's in part limited by the fact that we haven't fully leveraged evolutionary and population genetic theory to interpret these data. So I'll focus the first part of my talk and go through this quickly 
using the colon as a model system. And this is in part because this is where aspects of tumor initiation were first worked out by Fearon and Vogelstein some decades ago, and in part because we also know that there are these well-defined benign stages of growth termed adenomas that are non-invasive and invasive carcinomas. And so really, although the initial observations about sort of the progression or tumor initiation cascade were based on cross-sectional data from individuals of different ages, this notion that sequential clonal evolution can be used to describe not just tumor initiation, but subsequent stages of growth, whereby we have a fit, a more fit clone that comes to dominate the population, really has become the de facto model. It is the textbook model um, that at least many of us have grown up with. And so what does that mean? Just shown in a cartoon schematic, what I'm referring to is the notion that prior to transformation, we have this sort of occult phase during which uh, selection and clonal expansion take place, and this results in the accrual of somatic mutations, which will then become public or clonal in the final tumor. Um, at the time of transformation, we continuously accrue somatic alterations. These are now private because they're present in a subpopulation of the tumor. And in this linear or successive clonal expansion model, it's assumed that these clones confer such a strong selective advantage that they can outcompete their neighbors almost independent of when they occur during this timeline. And so the question is, is this model compatible with the vast majority of cancer genomic data that we now have in hand and the patterns of pervasive intertumor heterogeneity that we've observed? And so we proposed an alternate model that we thought could potentially explain these data and then sought out to test the predictions of this model. And in this scenario, what we propose is that again, we have the accrual of somatic alterations leading up to transformation after transformation, we continuously accrue private alterations. But in this model, the timing of an alteration is the fundamental determinant of its frequency in the final tumor, meaning that mutations that are accrued at a sufficiently late point in time may not attain detectable frequencies in, cur in current sequencing data. And so really this implies that the timing of a mutation is, is the fundamental arbitrator of its frequency rather than subclonal selection. And you can see that in this scenario where we have a terminal expansion, that the heterogeneity that observed is sort of natural to this phenomenon. So to test this model, um, we went about in collaboration with Daryl Shibata, who had for many, many decades been collecting colorectal tumors and, and doing work on isolating single CRIPS. Um, and the beauty of this system is one, that these CRIPS are relatively pure populations. They're composed of on the order of two to 10,000 cells. And importantly, that not only simplifies the downstream bioinformatic analysis, meaning we're dealing with less cellular admixture, but moreover, because we're working in a relatively small population, we would expect that even a small selective advantage in a gland should homogenize the population. And so um, what we did was to sample from opposite sides of a tumor, some three centimeters apart. We did this for colorectal adenomas and carcinomas. And we were interested in delineating the topography or the phylogenetic relationship between these populations. Of course, we can also characterize drivers and passengers. Um, but really, the goal was to, to um, ask the question, could we detect subclonal selection here? Was the signal? left on the genome. And so this work was led by a very talented postdoc in my group, Andrea Sotoriva, who's now a group leader at the ICR in London. And I'm gonna kind of breeze through it since it's been published, but I wanna make the point that what we found was actually quite striking on multiple levels. So what I'm showing you here is just a summary of allele frequency information here for a control mutation. This is an APC event, which takes place in some 90% of colorectal cancers, and we would expect it to be clonal or present in all cells of the tumor. Indeed, it's present in an allele frequency of one. One copy has been lost due to LOH, and we see that it's public. When we look at other events in this same tumor, we see that they can be um, present in an allele frequency of roughly 0.5, and these are individual glands with the bulk data overlaid, shown here. Um, and what we see is that there's mixture. So the same exact point mutation can be found up to three centimeters apart in different regions of the tumor from the left and orange from the right. So these patterns are variegated. And that's quite striking. We're saying that the same point mutation or the same copy number breakpoint, for that matter, if we look at that level, are found spatially separated and yet not present in every cell of the tumor. 
Intriguingly, when we looked at adenomas, we again have a clonal control and APC mutation. But instead of seeing this pattern of variegation, we see that mutations are restricted to either the right or the left, and they're absent entirely from the other region of the tumor. And so this suggests that there's patterns of spatial variegation when we look at intratumor heterogeneity at the level of single glands that were unanticipated. And this holds true across all of the adenomas that we examined, where we see no mixing, so red indicates that the mutation is present, white is absent, they're spatially segregated between the left and right side, shown in purple and orange. In contrast, for all of the carcinomas we examined, we see mixing between mutations, variegation, and this is observed at the mutational and the copy number level. And so, in a way, you can think of that, if we flip this cross-sectional view of tumor evolution on its side, where distance from the vertical line indicates increasing time from the origin of the tumor, those mutations that accrue late are present in increasingly diminutive fractions of the total population. So when we summarize all of the data, what we find is really that there's evidence for uniformly high intertumor heterogeneity, and this is true at every spatial scale we look, whether it's bulk tumor, single glands, or even single cells. The fact that we see um, such high variation really implies the absence of recent clonal expansions. And moreover, the fact that mutations were clonal within a gland, as I showed you here, despite being subclonal in the bulk of the tumor population, suggests that they had time to fixate or be lost. Um, and finally, this or analysis is corroborated when we use a molecular clock analysis based on neutral methylation tag profiling. So what we really wanted to do, though, was to actually begin to measure parameters from individual patients and to ask questions about their evolutionary dynamics. So the data, this was really the starting port for these assays. So to do this, Andre developed a fully spatial computational model of tumor growth where we simulate the 3D structure of a tumor, in this case up to 80 billion cells, and we sample different regions of the tumor just as we did experimentally. And so there's computational tricks that we can do to make this actually tractable. But what we then want to do is to compare the simulated data or the virtual tumors to the actual patient data within a statistical inference framework. And in this case, we use approximate Bayesian computing, which has been well established in the population genetics literature. We employ this because it simply would not be tractable to compute likelihoods in this scenario. And what we want to do is to, to measure several parameters of interest, namely the mutation rate, mu, and the subclone fitness differences, sigma. And so when we apply this framework to our data set, what we can see is that congruent with the predictions of the Big Bang model, indeed, public alterations occur very early, and this is not um, this is not unanticipated. We expect this to be the case. They happen on the order of 10 to the 4 cells. That's just a good control since these were by definition present in the founding tumor cell. But the majority of private alterations, in particular side variegated and vi variegated events, also happen very early on the order of 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 5th cells. To put this in context, this is orders of magnitude before we potentially detect the tumor or routinely resect it. And so if we summarize the data another way, when we look at this in aggregate, we're looking at individual patient data where we summarize the frequency of side variegated or variegated, so private events versus public events. Really, the early events dominate the landscape of this late stage sampled tumor. So we're looking at an echo of the primordial cancer when we sample um, later stage tumors. And so importantly, we can also go back and show that we can measure individual parameters from these data. And so what we're looking at here is the subclone fitness differences and the mutation rate for adenomas versus carcinomas. It should be immediately apparent that the mutation rate is significantly higher in the carcinomas. But moreover, and importantly, we can show that we can measure subclone fitness differences. And yet, what I told you before is that Overall, we fail to see a dramatic change in the subclonal architecture of these tumors, meaning that while selection is detectable, it is likely compatible with a model of effective neutrality or effectively neutral evolution. And so to summarize, um, the Big Bang model provides us with a new way of thinking about cancer genomic data and for inter interpreting it uh, within a quantitative framework. And so what we've shown is that um, in this model, and in a subset of colorectal tumors, the timing of a mutation is the fundamental determinant of its frequency, and although we can detect selection, it may be insufficient to dramatically alter um, the landscape of those tumors. So importantly, 
this also implies that most of the detectable heterogeneity occurs early. And what I'm saying is detectable. That does not mean that there's not additional heterogeneity that, that we can't see, but this suggests that when we go in and apply a therapy, an exogenous bottleneck is going to happen, and we may particularly enrich for those aggressive subclones that we simply could not see prior to therapy. Um, and moreover, the data suggest, although this could not be fully tested in this setting, that some tumors may be born to be bad, wherein their invasive and potentially metastatic potential is specified early. So what I've shown you is really that um, there's different ways of thinking about how tumors evolved, and many others have contributed to this work. Um, Nikki talked about some of the work on branched evolution. In solid tumors, we see very limited evidence for this clonal succession model. Rather, we see abundant evidence for branched evolution, and in fact, other groups have gone on to demonstrate that big bang dynamics or effectively neutral growth are observed in other tumor types, and I believe that Trevor, who's up next, will be telling you more about that as well. So this raised the question, what are the patterns that we should expect to see? What are the patterns of intertumor heterogeneity that should occur under a model of effective neutrality versus strong positive selection? And so two talented postdocs in my group set out to ask this question, and really what we're showing here is just a schematic where we've bi-sampled a tumor that's evolving neutrally, and we've bi-sampled two regions, a tumor um, that's under stringent selection. And what I want to point out here is that we're looking at the histograms, the number of somatic SNVs that are present at a given frequency, and we expect to see this peak of public alterations hovering around an allele frequency of 0.05. Of course, they're spread in those values, and that is precisely because there's measurement noise, there's cellular admixture, we have to adjust for purity and ploidy, but these are what the real measurements look like. And then there's this long tail distribution where at some point at this value theta, we, we fail to pick up these mutations. And of course, that depends on our sequencing depth. But importantly, in a scenario of stringent selection, we may only see enrichment for those subclonal mutations in one region of the tumor, we know that different subsections may be under differential selective pressure due to nutrients or vasculature. And so, in fact, it can be challenging to discriminate um, private events that are enriched in one region from public events with a single sample. And so, fortunately, um, work from Rick Durrett and also work that Trevor will talk about um, coming up we, we have a good understanding, and there's a nice theoretical solution for what the site frequency spectrum or the variant allele frequency distribution should look like under neutral growth in a well-mixed population, and that expression's here. And so now we can really look at the cumulative proportion of S and Vs um, and their allele frequencies. So this has worked out for well-mixed populations, but as I told you before, when we're talking about solid tumors, we have a lot of spatial constraints. And so the solution isn't... Um, analytically tractable, and what we can do, though, is to actually simulate this process. So we developed a, uh, built on our, our spatial simulation growth model, where now we can model neutrality, as well as selection and different um, cell fitness coefficients. Here, we're really modeling um, the cell proliferative rate. We can then simulate these virtual tumors and subsample from them in different manners, and we can look at the site frequency spectrum for region A relative to region B, and we're just showing that way so that we can pair the distributions between these two regions of the tumor. And so we applied this framework to um, several publicly available cancer genome sequencing data sets for which at least two samples of the same tumor had been sequenced, as well as our own colorectal cancer cohort. We importantly had to process this in a uniform framework and really wanted to leverage the information from multiple samples, and so we developed a multi-region sample caller for this purpose. And then we can ultimately compare the observed data from the actual patient samples with the results that we ob obtain under our simulation. And for those of you that are interested in the details, I'm happy to chat more about this, but essentially we can um, model the neutral rate per cell division rate. We can also impose a positive or a beneficial selectively advantageous mutation rate on this. We are here only modeling positive selection. We're not actually modeling deleterious events, and we'll get to how complex this scenario is already. But it's really instructive to compare against the null neutral model because selection indeed becomes very complicated very quickly. Importantly, here we're assuming that a single DEEM is composed of on the order of five to 10,000 cells, and then we can model the expansion and splitting via a random branching process. And so um, 
when we do this, we then derive these site frequency spectrums from which we can obtain different metrics of intertumor heterogeneity. And so we, um, using the information that we had from multiple samples, defined several new metrics that we thought would be informative. One is the fraction of high frequency events. Um, these are region specific out of all region specific subclonal SNVs. This is a similar metric. This is just FH sub based on the fraction of subclonal SNVs with high frequency. We use Wright's F statistic or the fixation index, which is a natural measure of genetic divergence between regions here. And then we can also compute things like the Kolmogor of Smirnov distance to compare the site frequency spectrum between regions. And finally, I'll point out this metric, the REOC, which is simply the ratio of the area under the cumulative site frequency case pooled across samples um, relative to that from the theoretical neutral SFS. And so what do we see when we simulate these data? Um, what's shown in the top panel is a clone map under a neutral model, a naive neutral cancer stem cell model, relatively weak selection, a coefficient of 0.01 up to a coefficient of 0.1. And what you can probably see apparently, so we've only highlighted clones above a particular frequency, otherwise essentially every cell would look distinct and we would see a mass of colors. But from the um, histograms of the site frequency spectrum, you can see that in these three scenarios, they're generally um, bimodal. And in fact, we see very little enrichment for these region-specific um, SNVs. In contrast, under the models of stronger selection, we start to see enrichment for these blue subclones, sometimes in only one region. And so we can ask the question, um, how does this compare to the theoretical neutral? And we can compute various metrics, but the takeaway from this, so the theoretical neutral line is shown in black here, is that when we simulate um, stochastically this process, we can see that there's significant deviation from the neutral line. Those lines falling below the curve are indicative of spatial constraints. And in this scenario, when we simulate under stronger selection coefficients and see deviation, this is indicative of selection. So we can also ask the question, how well can we discriminate from the theoretical neutral model under different sequencing depths, as well as different numbers of samples? And this is of interest to us because we want to understand how we can improve our study designs and what sort of data we need to generate to discriminate between these modes. Here we're using the metric of the RAUC. This is for one sample and then for a single sample from 160x going up to 640x. So what you can see is that in these lower depth scenarios with a single sample, we really struggle to discriminate between the different evolutionary modes. When we start to achieve a greater sequencing depth for which there's probably one tumor out there on the planet with this kind of depth, um, we can begin to discriminate a little bit better. And in the case of two samples, we can already discriminate between effectively neutral growth and more stringent selection. Four samples buys us a bit more. Um, and eight samples is, is really a modest improvement. But perhaps more importantly, since as I said, this represents a well-mixed population, um, the theoretical neutral there, we want to compare against the different simulations. And so we can use this metric RAUC for both the single sample setting and the multi-region sample setting. It's not necessarily the most optimal metric, but in this case, what we can see is indeed, it's very challenging at low sequencing depth to discriminate between neutral growth and stringent selection. And yet when we use an improved metric of intertumor heterogeneity that captures between region genetic divergence, namely FH sub, with as few as two samples, we can robustly discriminate between stringent selection and neutrality. We can't discriminate between a selection coefficient of 0.05 and 0.1. So now we can ask, how do these patterns look on actual patient samples? And we went back to our colorectal co cancer cohort. Here I'm just showing you the, the um, site frequency spectrum histograms you've seen before for different colorectal tumor types. And we wanted to see how this compared across the major subgroups, including microsatellite stable syn negative tumors, microsatellite stable syn positive, and microsatellite instable tumors. And so, not surprisingly, we see this peak at roughly 0.5 of abundant um, near clonal mutations in the microsatellite instable case, presumably um, because this defect occurred prior to transformation. And if we look at the variant allele frequencies for region B relative to region A, what we see is that many of the known colorectal cancer driver genes fall precisely at an allele frequency of 0.5, and they're shared between different tumor regions. In contrast, there's many subclones that are region specific. And moreover, if we want to delve even deeper, deeper we can perform single gland exome sequencing. And um, really what this shows us is a very complicated landscape. Still, the mutations within glands are clonal, but now we can compare the distribution of mutations in 
relative to the bulk tumor. Here we see they're shared between all. In other cases, only mutations that are found in bulk region A are restricted to glands from that subregion. And so there's really a complex hierarchy. And if we draw the phylogenetic tree based on this single gland sequencing data, we can see that almost every gland forms its own lineage within the tree. So indeed, the complexity is quite vast. But moreover, we can go to these other data sets where multi-region sequencing was performed and ask how do their site frequency spectrum histograms look and what we see just for a representative colorectal tumor are shown here, an esophageal carcinoma. Um, these were subject to whole genome sequencing, lung adenocarcinomas, as well as glioblastomas. And in this case, we have a paired pretreatment and recurrent sample. And we were interested in comparing these precisely because we assumed that when patients receive um, certain chemotherapeutic agents, as in the case of telmazolamide, which is an alkylating agent, that we would expect to see strong clonal selection. And indeed, the patterns differ. So here, in some of these cases, we're seeing striking enrichment for region or private-specific events that attain high frequency. But I want to point out something important. Despite this fact, um, we really need to be careful that although we see enrichment for clonal clusters, this does not guarantee that these clones are unique in their identity, meaning that shared variant allele frequency is not a good surrogate. And, and we might know that already because they don't guarantee a unique phylogeny, but just to illustrate this point, in this particular patient sample, um, there, in this particular patient there were four different regions. We can see that there's a variant allele frequency cluster here hovering around 0.5, and then there's two subclonal clusters. And if we then perform, um, just simply look at the scatter plots for any two regions from those clusters, from that sample, we see that the clonal cluster persists, it's shown here in green, as here, but the other subclones split into distinct populations, meaning that many of these algorithms that are aimed at defining clonal clusters perhaps um, are a bit uh, misleading in the sense that this, is, this does not guarantee a clonal identity, and this is true irrespective of how we slice or dice the data. Intriguingly, I will say, though, that with enough samples, we may be able to identify a neat clone. And in this case, we believe that one of these clones is under such stringent selection that it is actually uh, representative of a, a true clonal population. But this took four samples to achieve that, and so it's definitely not the norm. So we can then compare what the site frequency spectrum looks like for different histologies relative to the theoretical neutral shown here in black. And I'll point out that we spiked in a few other interesting samples to try and get a handle on how well we were measuring selection in actual patient tumors. you, I can't explain this slide without an image. <laughs> it's going to come back. Um, and I can't draw it either, so. I could act, I could try. Yes. All right, we're back in business. Okay. So we can, so in this case, what we spiked in was actually a paired Barrett's esophageal lesion and it's matched adenocarcinoma. And as I showed you before, we anticipate that there will be stringent selection leading up to transformation. And indeed, we see this deviation above the theoretical neutral. And in the brain lesions, we had both glioblastoma and gliomas that were treated with temozolomide. These are shown here by these dotted lines. And again, they show significant deviation. So we can, of course, quantify what these, inter what these metrics of intertumor heterogeneity look like, but this is a lot of data to digest. Um, and we can compare the patient data with our simulated data. However, this, this leaves something to be desired in terms of actually how we move forward with classifying samples. And so what we did was to take each of the intertumor heterogeneity metrics, all five of them, and we um, compiled their independent components and then trained a support vector machine on this with the goal of discriminating between tumors that are um, 
under stringent selection versus those that are um, evolving neutrally. And so what's shown here in the transparent circles are the simulated data. Of course, we need ground truth data. We don't actually know what the modes of tumor evolution are. So we are reliant on training the model on these simulated tumors. And we realize that that in indicates that this really could be model dependent. But superimposed on this is actually the primary tumor data derived from patient samples. And you can see here the decision boundary stratifying tumors that are evolving neutrally from those that are under stringent selection. And remarkably, um, this actually seems to uh, categorize our tumors despite having very diverse histologies and making some assumptions about how those tumors were evolving. And importantly, we can also then go in and ask the question, how does this information help us delineate the drivers and what actually we should be targeting in these patient samples? And so shown here is a plot of two metrics of intertumor heterogeneity relative to the driver fold enrichment for, not, for public um, non-silent or coding SNVs. And so what we see is that there's actually a negative correlation between the measures of between region um, genetic divergence. And this implies that in tumors that are evolving neutrally, we see an enrichment for drivers amongst public events. So maybe that's not surprising. We expect that those are there prior to transformation, that maybe those tumors have already achieved a fitness plateau. In contrast, in tumors that are evolving under more stringent selection, such as these up here, we see that they have higher between region genetic divergence, and we observe a positive correlation between these measures of heterogeneity and the ratio of more functional versus less functional private SNVs, meaning that amongst tumors that exhibit stringent subclonal selection, putative driver events may be private in these cases. And so this raises the question, what should we be targeting? And can we think about how the evolutionary modes actually informs this process? So in tumors that are evolving neutrally, perhaps we want to be targeting truncal alterations. In tumors that are evolving under stringent selection, we very well may need to go after these events that are on the branches of the tree. And so in another question that this really helps us to begin to address is to resolve a long-standing debate about whether metastatic progression evolves in a linear or a parallel fashion. And this is um, really, we've seen a resurgence of this, but what I'm getting at is, are we talking about the fact that we have a genetically advanced population of cells that then go on to seed distant metastases? Or could these be evolving in parallel? And while I don't have time to go into the details of how we're addressing this question, what I will say is that the mode of primary tumor growth is fundamental for understanding the dynamics of metastasis. And if we don't model this appropriately, we're likely to arrive at an erroneous conclusion. And so just in closing, I've spent a lot of time talking about this aspect of tumor evolution, namely how subclonal evolution and genetics influences um, this process. And of course, this is in part because it's what we're good at measuring as a community. It isn't the end all. And we're also very interested in understanding how microenvironment and environmental exposures um, alter um, tumor progression. Um, critically though, this is hard to get at in many patient samples. We don't necessarily have access to samples unless we're studying leukemias. It's much harder in solid tumors, although it can be done. And so one of the ways we're going about this is through a very rich collaboration with Calvin Quo, who's also at Stanford, where we've been able to um, culture human organoids from diverse tissue types. In this case, these are all wild type and really using the elegant air liquid interface approach that he had developed some time ago, we can then go on to use CRISPR-Cas9 and other genetic engineering techniques to oncogenically transform these tissues. We can transplant them into mice and give rise to in vivo tumorigenicity. And in parallel, we can go the other route and actually top down model cancer progression by taking patient biopsies from individuals and culturing them. And in fact, it's also possible to culture their immune, some of their immune cells with this, although I will say the efficiency goes down dramatically. And so with this, we can really begin to establish a patient-derived organoid um, biobank where we can go in and ask the question, how do, um, how does it, you know, if we target a particular mutation that we believe is implicated in resistance to a given therapeutic, um, do we see an alteration in response and so forth? And so um, really we need to sort of be facile in how we go between the patient models and then these experimental or in vitro platforms um, because it's clear that there's a number of questions that we simply can't get at with one strategy or another. Uh, ultimately, though, we're hoping to use this information to predict 
how tumors will evolve and to forecast their future trajectories. And so I think, I, I hope I've shown you that tumors are indeed governed by evolutionary principles. What we hope to do is to learn how they adapt to different environmental exposures, how they evolve in a treatment naive setting. Uh, we've shown that the mode of primary tumor evolution has fundamental implications for defining the drivers of growth, but also its future trajectory. And this is also true of what happens when we impose therapy. Um, it's really quite instructive to consider a null neutral model. And this is in part because we can generate testable predictions. I've talked about one aspect of selection, namely positive selection for selectively advantageous mutations. There's a lot of other factors that can influence this process, which we didn't discuss, and uh, including clonal cooperation and competition. And uh, it's, you know, we really need simulation frameworks to begin to understand how, what sort of patterns might arise in this context. So computational modeling can also enable us to infer patient-specific parameters, and it allows us to get a handle on the balance between stochastic and deterministic factors. And so in ongoing work, um, we're very interested in how we can apply these approaches to longitudinal omic data to develop multi-scale predictive models. And with that, I will thank the many people in my lab, particularly Ruping Sun and Zheng Hu, who did a lot of the, the last bit of work that I described, as well as our collaborators, Daryl Shibata, Andrea Sotoriva, who's now at the ICR, and Trevor Graham. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. But before that, one plug. Um, so although we just closed the highlights track for this um, a few weeks ago, we still are ex accepting late-breaking posters, and you can still register. This is for the recomp cancer computational biology workshop that will be held at UCLA. And if you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer any of those. Thank you.